Hola, hello, I'm Eddie Arusa, and I'm delighted to be hosting this very special conversation in celebration of Lyric Opera Chicago's first Spanish language opera to be presented as part of its main stage season. That opera is Daniel Catan's Florencia en el Amazonas, a work that premiered on October 25th, 1996, which happens to be 25 years ago to the day that we're recording this conversation. Ever since that triumphant first night, Florencia has had productions around the world, becoming a much admired and beloved hit with audiences. It has been staged by more than a dozen U.S. opera companies, as well as companies in Mexico and Europe. For its first presentation of Florencia en el Amazonas, Lyric Opera of Chicago has created a new production for Chicago audiences. It has the distinction of being directed by Francesca Zambello, the renowned stage director who directed the world premiere production in 1996. She currently serves as the general and artistic director of the Glimmerglass Festival near Cooperstown, New York, and is the artistic director of Washington National Opera. And starring in lyric operas Florencia en el Amazonas is Ana Maria Martinez, an internationally admired Latina soprano who is portraying an internationally admired Latina soprano. Ana Maria has become a favorite here in Chicago thanks to her many star appearances. We're also incredibly fortunate to have Andrea Puente Catan with us. She is the widow of Florencia's composer, Daniel Catan. Senora Puente Catan is currently the director of Major Gifts and Hispanic Initiatives at San Diego Opera, but she's also well a well-known artist who played a key role in the opera's creation, and she joins us from San Diego to offer her perspectives on Flor Florencia. And to top it all off, conductor Jordan D'Souza, who has been hailed as part of the new generation leading Berlin's classical music scene while he served with distinction at the Komische Oper Berlin, will lead Lyric Stellar Cast and the equally uh, stellar Lyric Opera Orchestra in his exciting company debut. It's my great pleasure to welcome all four of these luminaries to our virtual discussion today. Bienvenidos a todos. So good to have you here. Welcome all. Gracias. <laughs> <laughs> Andrea Puente Catón, let's begin with you. What are your thoughts and sentiments as Lyric Opera of Chicago presents this 25th anniversary production? And how do you believe Daniel would be reacting to it? So I'll start with the last one. I think he will be, he wouldn't believe it. He will be thrilled, beyond thrilled. And I have to thank uh, Francesca a lot and Ana Maria for singing this role. and. Uh, you know, mix mix uh, feelings. You know, because in the one hand, in the United States of America, this work is played and played and played, and in the other hand, we only saw the first time of we saw Florencia on stage was um, in its twentieth anniversary, five years ago in Mexico City. So. It's always, uh, we, I, we always have this feeling, you know, like in the States, they always play it and they celebrate it. And I'm very happy it's happening in Chicago. I, I mean, this, this is a, a city where it's full of Hispanic people and um, Spanish all over the place. So thank you so much. It's, it's a celebration. Thank you. And we're delighted to have this being presented here in Chicago. And I would just imagine that Daniel in the magical realm in which he is looking down upon us is probably going to be delighted with this new production. Now the opera was co-commissioned by the opera companies of Houston, Los Angeles, and Seattle, but it was up to Daniel to choose the subject matter. So Andrea Puente Catan, can you share with us from where he drew the inspiration for Florencia? Yeah, well, we, we also have to remember that we have a librettist that is very, it's a key person in this, and her name is Marcela Fuentes Verán, so we should, honor her too Absolutely. And, uh, and and you know Francesca knows the story the story better than I because uh, in, I was not with Daniel in those years that doesn't mean that I didn't know about this happening because I was in in Mexico but um, so there were three houses uh, yes choosing this subject matter Daniel I think Daniel and and and, and Marcela were really working together in choosing these characters. Now, the love of Daniel for Latin American literature, it has always, it, it was super big. So uh, he loved these characters of Garcia Marquez and they draw from different stories 
uh, such characters that were source, sources of inspiration, and then the, the story became Florencia. And you're, you're speaking, of course, of Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and I want to talk a, a little bit more about him and the influence that he's had on this opera, and of course, in literature in general, but we're going to get to that in just a moment. Francesca Zambello, did you have any expectations 25 years ago tonight that Florencia would become such a beloved part of the contemporary operatic repertoire? and that you would be directing it all these years later? Uh, no, of course not. Um, but I think that's the testament to the endurance of the incredibly beautiful score and the real poetry uh, that Marcella evokes, uh, inspired very much by Marquez. And the collaboration that we had we when we started the piece, uh, we went and saw Marquez. And that really was, I think, a seminal meeting where the idea for the opera was explored and discussed and, you know, flowered this much. And I'm thrilled that the piece has had so many productions and representations. And I'm thrilled that I've directed it a number of times and that the lyric is really investing in it again in, in a brand new production, which is a major, major thing for an opera house. And Ana Maria has been involved in the piece for a number of years playing one of the younger roles and now let's and now the protagonist. Uh, and so it's it's been a thrilling journey. And of course the piece is the journey and and it's a life journey about love, which is which is Marquez at its core. Well Francesca, as you revisit this work 25 years on, do you have new insights or perspectives that perhaps you have thought about over the years that you're bringing to this much anticipated new production at Lyric Opera? And well, absolutely. I mean, it, as a director, no matter what you do or as a musician, you of course it changes every time you do something because you're older and you have more sentiments. Um, I mean, the, the story of the opera very briefly, uh, I think for listeners it is, is about Florencia, famous diva who is returning to her homeland to travel to Manaus to sing a concert in trying to evoke Cristobal, who was her lover several uh, decades ago to come out from the jungle because he has been in the jungle chasing the emerald muse butterfly. But when, to answer your question, I say that because there are several different couples on the boat and they are each different ages. There's a very young couple who are idealistic, uh, Rosalba and Arcadio, there's a more mature couple, Paola and Alvaro, and then there's the captain of the boat, and there's Florencia, and then there's a magical, magical creature named Rio Lobo, the river wolf. And so I find that I've like, I identified with the young couple, and then I've been to the middle-aged couple, and now I'm approaching the captain. Well, that's good to know. I, I can't wait to see how your, your direction of, of this production is uh, has matured, as maybe we can say, uh, over the years. Ana Maria Martinez, it's always so good to have you back at Lyric Opera of Chicago, where you appeared almost every season since you made your debut in 2008. But there really is a lot of excitement about you singing Florencia in this historic production, in no small part because the composer, Daniel Catan, encouraged and almost had to beg you to take on the title role. Can you tell us a little bit about your relationship with Florencia as well as Daniel Catan? As Andrea told us, uh, you played one of the other a lead soprano uh, character for a while, but then you became Florencia. But tell us about how Daniel almost had to uh, twist your arm to sing that role. Well, Daniel, uh, I think for those who, who did not have the opportunity to meet him, can do so through his music. Because we've all said that, that when, when having known him and being his friend and colleague, I feel that he's very present. And I've said that to Andrea, that I, I feel his presence when I'm hearing any part of the score. It's very moving. And he, he was brilliant. And I think that his, his energy as a person just vibrated at a very high level all the time. And when I met him, uh, it was 2001, and I was doing the role of Rosalba. Uh, she's the, the journalist, she's the writer, she's very driven and very career focused, and she wants to be an independent woman, beautiful character. And, and, and very romantic lines, and she doesn't discover that love uh, within herself or that, that poetry truly until later in, in the piece. However, I was, I was singing that role, and, and when I met Daniel, he was um, attending one of our stage rehearsals. 
And he said, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd really like for you to sing this one day. And I said, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. And he'd say, well, why not? I said, because it's just too hard. <laughs> and uh, technically, he said, well, what do you mean it's too hard? And I said, technically, where it sits, it's just a, a very tough sing. I, I think it's a combination of Donna Anna in Don Giovanni and Tosca. It's, it's both in, in one. Uh, it's, it's just gorgeous. And, and the first time that I had the opportunity to do this was several years ago where I finally felt ready and Andrea was present. And I remember that uh, she kindly came to my dressing room afterwards. We had seen each other through the years many times. And then after the performance, she came to my dressing room and we just hugged each other. We didn't say anything. We just cried because we knew, you know, that finally I, I was able to, to do it. But I think this is another subject altogether as a singer. It's so important to take on a challenge, a responsibility to sing a role only when you feel you're ready. And sometimes it'll be a leap of faith. Sometimes it'll be a big risk, but it's so important to make sure that the roles you choose to do prepare you for the ones that are more technically demanding. And now, of course, on an emotional level, it's a full circle having played the young ingenue and then the older one. Uh, and they're so similar but at different points in their life and their development. And it's, it's really a full circle, especially the duet that they have in the second act. Ah, it's, it's a, for me personally, it just it gets me emotional. Yeah. I think we're getting emotional just hearing you describe it. So I can't wait to hear it. Uh, Maestro Jordan D'Souza, welcome to Chicago and what an auspicious work with which to make your lyric opera debut. In your still young career, you've been acclaimed for conducting a wide range of contemporary operas, especially in your native Toronto with the Tapestry Opera uh, Company, which only presents world premieres of Canadian operas. Tell us how you believe Florencia fits into the contemporary opera scene or the literature in general. You know, Florencia is a, is a special piece in that it's so clear to me, you know, when I, when I listened and, and, and read a little bit about the piece and you hear people describe the music of, of Daniel Catan, and you know, they, they like to evoke, this is Debussy, it's got Puccini, but to be honest, for me, it's clear that this was an opera lover who wrote this music, somebody who not only knew the literature, understood the literature, and could understand what the power of opera could be, what a scene really needed, and not just a climax, how you build that you know, to a climax, the combination of lyricism and also kind of banal conversation sometimes, and that that heightens actually the lyricism of the piece. So for me to discover this piece, it was really different than a lot of the other contemporary pieces I've done, in that not only is it you know, melodic is there's not you know it, it's built in such a kind of traditional way it, you know in a way it, you can see that it is the son of so many of the great operas that's come before it but what he does with the language i think when you look to all the great opera composers it's people who can do something with a text and for me spanish isn't a language i speak so it's been a pleasure for me to learn the language through the kind of childlike view of Daniel Catan, because it's so beautifully set, the language, it sings so wonderfully, and the colors of the language, he's able to sometimes, just for two measures, evoke a certain atmosphere that disappears, and then we have six measures of something different. And if you look to the text, it all flowers so naturally and blossoms from the words. So for me, it's been, in a way, a lot of the, uh, the same approach of beginning with the real text work and trying to kind of motivate all of these brilliant sounds he's found in the orchestra and also by another token it feels completely different than everything else we do because it's so fresh we're discovering we're playing it's like being in a workshop sometimes we say hmm, what happens if we took a little bit of time there what happens if that was more spoken than sung so those kinds of things it has a freshness that's uh, you know invigorating i think for all of us and give us your impression of lyric opera's orchestra which is acclaimed as in itself and how you've worked with the musicians on a work that I would assume that is new to m most, if not all of them. Believe it or not, I haven't met the orchestra yet. So oh, generally the way the it. rehearsal process goes is that we start in the room with the singers, with a piano, and I'll meet the orchestra for the first time in three days. But you're right that, you know, it's very different than approaching a Don Giovanni or something like that, that they played, you know, that they can play almost without a conductor and that this is a piece that we're all going to discover together. I think even for those who have done it before, this is not the kind of music that you find it and it stays that way. It's not stagnant. It's constantly becoming. It's not music that's being. And so it requires all of us together fresh. And I think we're going to find something new to say with this piece. Great. Uh, Francesca, it's it's rather rare for a director to be involved 
in the actual creation or production of an opera as you were with this. Not only did you travel to the Amazon basin and you took a, 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 your own journey through the Amazon, but you met with that great 20th century uh, giant of or literature, uh, giant of 20th century literature, I should say, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, which uh, Andrea was tell, telling us about. And his, his use of magical realism plays a big role in this opera. Can you describe for our audiences what magical realism is and how it was worked into this piece? But give us also a little bit of just a, a, a story about that journey that sure. you took, because sure. that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Right. I, I do want to just say, not to correct you, but just to say directors are often involved early on with librettists and composers. Um, we often work um, as a kind of dramaturg, often with them, uh, just helping sh shape a story. So th this was not really an anomaly, but getting to go to the Amazon and meeting Marquez, that was something spectacular. Yes, we went on a wonderful trip, all of the creative team we went to we went to Cartagena, which is in northern Colombia, uh, and we went to Leticia, um, which is on the Amazon, and stayed in an incredible hotel that satisfies every nightmare of mine I've ever had, called the Hotel Anaconda, um, which was sort of a like a negative B minus hotel where there literally were snakes outside everywhere. We went touring all over the jungle with a guide. Um, which was unbelievably scary because he would reach up and grab a snake out of the tree. But meeting Marquez, I will say at that time, Colombia uh, was fraught with the drug wars. And also Marquez was in a very complicated position politically. And so we went to his compound, which was deep in the jungle. And we flew there in a helicopter with armed guards and the armed guards, uh, we landed the helicopter in his compound and spent some beautiful time with him, uh, Marcella and Daniel, um, myself talking about the story, talking about, th and th this this opera uses characters from all of his works and, and inspirations. So, but believe me, the armed guards and the helicopters was something I will never forget. Um, as well as you know, traipsing through the jungle and riding uh, a riverboat very much like the El Dorado which has a kind of, the whole opera takes place on a boat, the El Dorado. Um, and it's all about the journey to Manaus where they actually never ever get there. And so it, it's, it, it, it was a remarkable ex experience, obviously one that I will never forget. And at that time also the woman who arranged it, I give a lot of credit to, her name was Gloria Zia and she is the wife of the famed sculptor Botero. And she was the minister of culture of Colombia. And so she was really one of the people who helped, who helped organize the entire trip. And it was a complete inspiration. I mean, meeting Marquez was like unbelievable. Um, and so okay, imagine. magic realism is a, a term that we throw around a lot about literature. We believe historically it started in the 20s in German literature, but Marquez really made it famous. And, and I think magic realism, you know, we see it in painting, we see it in poetry, we see it in music. But at the core of it is, in a sense, the ability for anything to happen. Um, not that it is necessarily magic, but in a piece like this, um, the young author's book falls over the water into the mouths of the piranhas, but the good river spirits bring the book back. Or suddenly pink rain is falling. That's because it's, it's people's, it's the sky crying. Those are the kinds of things that are Marquez. And what was so beautiful was Daniel's music had its own kind of magic realism and its own sense. I think when Jordan was talking about it's not about, yeah, we listen to that as musicians, we say, oh, that sounds like, but, but really he took these in colors uh, of these, of the poetry. The libretto is a beautiful libretto. We have all in opera terrible librettos, you know, so often libretto, you know, there's the window, you know, that's what's always so hard about contemporary librettos, but this, Marcella, who was a longtime student of Marquez, was really able to capture it. And he approved and wrote about everything. And that was interesting. You know, Marquez did not want films made of his works. And it was only after his death that they made that film um, of Love in the Time of Cholera. And I think that I think I think opera serves his spirit and magic realism better than anything else. And, and I think that mm. music can do that. I think A Hundred Years of Solitude would also be a beautiful opera because film, 
film is not film is too realistic for magic realism. I think literature and music and poetry serve that world. Uh, may I add something? And we should point uh, we should point out that the yes, go ahead. So Garcia Marquez talked often about magic realism. He, he was irritated by this term, but he said it's simply that fantasy or magic is inseparable from reality. And that's what happens in Latin America. And he would keep saying this. And I remember a conversation I had with Ana Maria about this, you know, like this happens to us all the time, this magic realism, because it's part of our reality somehow in Latin America. So I don't know if you want to expand Ana Maria, but um, it, it's a concept that that um, that he talked about. I, we have talked about it. I think what, what uh, uh, mm, the clearest way I could explain it is that it is a concept that we grow up with. It's, it's, we're, we're, when we start eating solid foods, you know, as a baby, we've been hearing this, we've been seeing this, we've heard our, you know, for example, the, the, that beautiful movie, uh, like Water for Chocolate, you know, having everybody cooking around and the feelings of the, of the chef are put into the food. And then if she was crying and sobbing about something that everybody who's eating it starts crying and sobbing too. It's almost like you can feel that. So, so that's kind of what, how, what I would say is that it, it's very much a part of our emotional vernacular. Uh, it's part, it's another layer to our language. It's another layer to our culture. Uh, so it's very familiar, and and when we come across the the genre, it's 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 like something lights up inside of us. It's, it's almost a sense of um, it, it. We could say it unites us as a culture because the Hispanic Latino culture is actually. I'm going into a bit of a tangent, but it's it's not as united. It is united under the umbrella of Spanish, but. Imagine it, these countries already existed with different cultures when Spain arrived, right? So you have all of these independent ways of seeing the world and functioning and culture then united under this umbrella. But I think yet a stronger unifier is that concept of magical realism. Which pervades, as you, mentioned, as you mentioned, all Latin American countries have kind of their own version based on their own culture, whether it was the indigenous culture, whether it was the culture that arrived much later. I want to turn back to uh, Maestro de Souza. As you mentioned earlier, over the last quarter century, commentators and critics have, have tried to describe Daniel's musical language in Florencia. They, they compare it to Richard Strauss or Puccini or Debussy. Uh, but one of the, th the most important thing is how audiences think about it and approach it. And as you probably know, in, in conducting and, and bringing to life new operas, sometimes audiences are a, a little resistant or they might be intimidated musical language in this and how it is accessible to audiences. Yeah, I think you were able to sneak in all of the buzzwords uh, these days about, and it's true, how, how do we approach this type of music? And I think one thing that's so clear about this score, and you know, a lot of the great composers could do that when you don't overthink it, when you sit down there and this sound from the very first sound he makes in the orchestra wafts over you and you don't have to think anymore about will I understand, you're immediately taken into this world. And you know, one of the things that's really gratifying, I think, for the, will be for the orchestra as well as for me in being a part of this opera is that the orchestra really is a character in this opera. It's not some background wallpaper type of music. It's really, I think, you know, with the singers, I've been encouraging them really to think this, this idea of magical realism can almost become a bit of a burden to us because really the magic should come from the orchestra and the realism often comes from the singers inhabiting these scenes. And that's something he does really well in the colors of the orchestra, in the, you know, kind of the songfulness of this piece. There's a yearning in, in a lot of the music that you can relate to immediately. And, you know, and it's, it's, of course, you can see the influence of these composers like you were alluding to. You know, every now and again, there's this absolutely beautiful, mysterious shadow cast over the end of a scene. And it's clear that he knew Peleas y Menizond. That is right taken out a page out of Debussy's. Now, it's not that you would ever mistake it for Debussy, but he understood how he found that temperature in the room. And he was able to kind of strike that mysterious chord again. So I would say, you know, it's it's the kind of music that almost requires no explanation. 
it's an experience. It's a very much an immersive experience to be a part of this, uh, to, to, to be a spectator, to be, you're a part of it, even when you're a listener. You really become part of this, this jungle sounds, there's the Amazon River, there's all of these beautiful natural elements, bird song, and never once do you think to yourself, how did he do that? You just say, oh, here I am, and this is where I belong. He makes it seem so natural. Well, audiences have certainly uh, embraced it over the last 25 years, and now it is time for Chicago to discover this incredible store. Andrea Puente Catan, let me return to the librettist in this, because I think we need to talk a little bit more about her and how uh, she developed this, this beautiful uh, libretto, because it was not based on any one work of Gabriel Garcia Marquez. This is all coming from her imagination. So tell us what Mar uh, Marcela Fuentes Barain uh, did with this libretto. Wow, <laughs> that's a heavy question. I cannot speak for Marcelo, but I can talk to you about their collaboration. Just, you know, Daniel, as he progressed as a composer, he finally made his own librettos. That's what happened. And this is a man that studied philosophy and so had a very keen sense of, of the word. But I think with Marcela, they were, I think, you know, at the beginning of their collaboration, I think they were having fun, like fun, 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 and saying, oh, yeah, let's take this one from, 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 the, from the cholera book, and then let's take this one from, you know, like uh, from the uh, hundred years of solitude. And so I think uh, it was truly something that evolved. They, they evolved together. I, I don't think they worked... Uh, you know, separately. And I think this is important to know. Of course, Daniel would, would you know, compose for, for many hours by himself and... and uh, but, but there was a strong collaboration there is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. And also, you know, there's another element here with, uh, and that I would, would like to say about Daniel, and you asked me about Marcela, but I think it will be uh, unfair for me to talk about Marcela more than Daniel, because I know Daniel better than Marcela. But uh, so Daniel tried always, or he said, he carried the legacy from Monteverdi to Alban Bear. And that's when you talk about the music and you hear this, and, and this is, um, I think this is important to know. And in terms of um, his love for literature and, and, and so on, he was very close to one of the best friends of Gabriel Garcia Marquez, which was Alvaro Mutis. And he was also a Colombian writer and he was kind of an expert about the river. So they would spend hours talking about how to, how to, you know, how to uh, imagine these scenes in the boat and the logs and what happens and how many knots are they going into or not. And so these, these, these scenes with, with the captain and with Arcadio and with Alvaro, with, um, I think they developed them together and then probably most likely had these conversations with Marcela, and then they have this, they, you know, the story became. Hmm. Bueno, we've been speaking in English about a Spanish language opera, and I think now we need to have a few comments in Spanish about hey. this historic hey. event. Muy bien. <laughs> Así que vamos a empezar con usted, señora Puente Catán. Uh, habíamos estado hablando en inglés sobre este, esta ópera en español. Señora Catán, sus pensamientos en este vigésimo quinto aniversario del estreno de Florencia en el Amazonas y quizás lo que Daniel también sentiría en esta ocasión. Bueno, o sea, esto me, a mí me saca las lágrimas saber que 25 años después esta ópera se sigue tocando a pesar de que Daniel se murió, ¿no? Entonces sí. es, 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 es como fantástico, es como casi magic realism que se está tocando en el lyric. Es algo como increíble, es como un sueño, ¿no? Entonces esa sería mi primera, mi primera opinión sobre esto. En, en, un, en un lugar donde hay tanta gente que habla español, que entienden, que entenderán esta historia desde muy, muy profundamente desde su ser, ¿no? Bueno, y Ana María, para, para continuar con ese, ese comento de la señora uh, Puente Catán, 
Uh, tú estás haciendo historia como la primera diva latina cantando la primera ópera en español presentada durante la temporada regular de Direct Opera de Chicago. ¿Qué piensas que tiene que suceder para que más óperas en español sean presentadas o estrenadas aquí en los Estados Unidos? Yo creo que eh, Andrea ha tocado un punto importante que, por ejemplo, en Chicago hay tanta gente de habla hispana también en todos los Estados Unidos, eh, la población latina, hispana, es enorme y sigue creciendo. Eh, pero, y existen, o sea, existen zarzuelas, existen óperas en español, existen, existen obras increíbles que de verdad se deberían celebrar y yo creo que sí, así será, eh, que ese apetito se está abriendo más. Eh, pero también quiero, quiero mencionar sobre esta obra y sobre el realismo mágico. Eh, por ejemplo, eh, nuestra fantástica directora Francesca dijo que el género en realidad empezó a formarse, a desarrollarse más o menos en, en el 22, 1922. Y aunque la cultura latina se ha identificado mucho con ese género, eh, sigue siendo algo que ya es más internacional. Y quiero enfatizar que, que no es solamente el, el, el pueblo nuestro, o sea, la gente de habla hispana que van a abrazar esta obra. Yo creo que es algo que le, le va a tocar a todo ser. Porque esta obra ya se ha hecho en, en tantos lugares distintos y yo creo que, que de verdad tiene un toque que garantiza que esta obra ya es respetada como parte del repertorio. Ese es el cambio grande que se ve en este aniversario tan importante de esta obra, es que ya se ha establecido como algo, como un repertorio normal. Y eso, esta obra en particular, abre, abre el mundo del repertorio en el idioma de español y se establece ya como algo que, que se acepta y también, por ende, eh, la población de habla hispana se, se siente identificada y representada sobre el escenario como un teatro como Lyric Opera Chicago. Es cierto, sí. Francesca Zambelo, ¿tienes uh, unos mensajes en español? No. Italian, French, German, Russian. <laughs> <laughs> Although I understand mostly everything in Spanish now. I, well, I, me, I think, me, actually, just one thing that she said, which I think is important. I, I have worked a lot in South America and Latin America. And I think that we have to think so much more of that, like this opera, I think will open up a door to doing Spanish music in this country. Because the way like, uh, you know, Yanufa became popular. Um, you know, I don't know why we don't have, you know, more operas written in Spanish. Zarzuela, you know, that should be part of our culture, music culture in this country. And I think it, it, it's so interesting to me that we've ex embraced things like Czech. How many people like Czech is their first language in this country? Whereas Spanish, it's like the second most important language in this country. And so I, I hope that a piece like this will bring that you know, bring that to the forefront. You know, mariachi music, they're like mariachi operas. They're great. And so well, Lyric, I, I, Lyric, I really- Lyric has presented a couple of mariachi operas uh, okay. outside of their regular season. So this isn't the first in Spanish altogether, but it's the first one that's part of the of the season. And, and, and Jordan D'Souza, maybe I'll ask you, since you have helped cultivate brand new operas in your native Canada, what do you tell either Uh, opera impresarios or uh, composers or conductors about bringing more Spanish language uh, operas to the United States, given the growing population here. I think if we use this uh, this piece as a model to say that this is a piece in which every artist involved is such it's such a joy to be a part of it and for the public as well and that's a kind of magical uh, combination already that there's something special going on there. And uh, if that can be the sign of what the future of, of contemporary opera can be, I think that's a very positive thing. Well, and with that, I have to give a huge gracias to Ana Maria Martinez, Andrea Puente Catan, Francesca Zambello, and Maestro Jordan Souza, and Jordan de Souza, and toy, toy, toy to all of you as the uh, as the opening night of this historic uh, opera nears. Thank you all so much for giving your time for this uh, this discussion tonight. And we hope you've enjoyed learning more about Florencia en el Amazonas. If you already have your tickets for Lyric Opera of Chicago's new production, 
we hope that the insights that our panel gave tonight are, are were beneficial and, and, and helped in your enhancement uh, enhancing your enjoyment of the opera when you see it. If you don't yet have your tickets, we hope you will consider joining us. The show runs from November 13th to the 28th at the Lyric Opera House. Regular tickets start at $39, but Lyric also offers $20 discount tickets for students and has other programs for teachers and young professionals. So visit lyricopera.org slash Florencia to learn more. I'm Eddie Arusa, and it's been a delight and pleasure to share this time with you. And we look forward to welcoming you for these magical upcoming performances and the beautiful company premiere of, of Florencia en el Amazonas at Lyric Opera of Chicago. Gracias. Adiós. 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 Gracias. En el Amazonas. <laughs>